So, so Lord, we just thank you for your wisdom, your word. We pray, God, that you would help us even as we look at the lessons in the next couple of chapters of Daniel and the lessons we can learn today and, um, and heed them and know that you are in control and that you are in control regardless of our circumstances. Mm -hmm. So, Lord, we thank you. We ask your blessing now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen in just a moment here. I'm going ahead to mute everybody, and, um, and then um, we'll get started with this lesson, uh, lesson two, and uh, it should be, uh, you should be able to see um, lessons from Daniel. Our theme tonight is that influence is greater than power, and we mean specifically political power, but it could be all other kinds of power as well that um, uh, this, this lesson, we're gonna look at Daniel. I, I, of course, show him in the lion's den, but that doesn't come till the end of his life. And I love that picture of Daniel in the lion's den. I'll tell you why even more detail when we get to that lesson, because it uh, shows him at the proper age, or at least close to that proper age for when that actually happened. One of the things I think that you'll find um, in this um, lesson, as we look at a PowerPoint here of my timeline, is that one of the things that timelines have done, um, this is just a review of what we did last week, chapter one of Daniel. We looked at the um, uh, Josiah, the revivals, that, uh, and the Jeremiah writing the letter to the captives, which we'll review briefly, and Daniel taken captive around 609, 605 uh, BC, at that time period. And um, once you do chronology and work with a chronological Bible or genealogies, you begin to find out the ages of people. And that really makes a difference. I think most of you would recognize that it's interesting to learn that Daniel was probably 14 years of age when he was taken captive. Um, and um, I think that's, that's important to recognize. Uh, one of the things that we also covered was the fact that Jeremiah wrote this letter, and, and, I, and I hope you took the time to read Jeremiah 29, and uh, the amazing letter that Jeremiah wrote the captives right when they were taken captive. Now, remember, most of the people in uh, uh, Judah that were taken captive in Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar weren't taken captive till 586. So nearly 20 years prior to that, they took just the most influential people. Uh, Babylon and many of the dictators in the ancient empires followed a code of the best way to conquer people. And that code was to strip them of their leadership, to take the most highly educated, highly influential, and especially the young people that were looked to as leaders from the other young people, and to take those people first. And then in about 15, 20 years, the rest of the nation would be so demoralized that they would be easy to conquer. And that's exactly what Nebuchadnezzar did. But we know that any strategy Nebuchadnezzar used, however, quote, good it was, it could only succeed if God allowed it. And, um, and we recognize that. And just to briefly review this, um, Nebuchadnezzar said this amazing thing that he was sending Judah into captivity. In other words, they were being sent like missionaries, hardly what we would look at as a missionary call, but you're going to be sent into a dark culture. And I want you to settle down there, learn the language of your captors, learn the language of Babylon, learn its culture, learn its history, build a family legacy, uh, have sons and daughters, and pray and, and seek the peace of the city, invest and serve in that city, and pray to the Lord for it. In its peace, you will have peace. And God, and, and rehearse God's promise. You're not going to be there forever. The purpose is to humble you. And it's the purpose is to prepare you to then manifest the kingdom in greater liberty. And, um, but Jeremiah said, you were going to be captive for 70 years. And therefore, when we think of the Daniel 1, and we think of the lessons, and just a brief review of that, we can see here Daniel and his friends were about 14 to 16 years of age. They knew that God's judgment was going to be redemptive. It wasn't going to be negative. 
They knew that because God said that, that this was going to be the purpose. He and his friends, they purposed not to defile themselves. They offered a creative alternative to protect even the life of their captor, even the one who was uh, being so harsh on them, or at least beginning to be, they offered a creative alternative. And uh, this was critical. This is what we call submissive disobedience. They couldn't go along with everything that Prince and Chief of the Eunuchs had given. And amazingly, at the end of chapter one, this was the summary of last week's lesson, the king interviewed them, and among them all, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they served before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in all his realm. Would to God that the remnant God is building in the church would be that way. 10 times more understanding, more compassionate, more discerning. That's what God's praying. That's what God's developing in us. And we're praying now, and I know the body of Christ is in many ways in America, for God's intervention in our nation right now. We would rather have God preserve the liberty model that the United States has portrayed. But we have to say, but if God allows us to go through judgment and a very difficult time, these lessons are critical. But they're not just critical if we go through judgment. They're critical at any time of our life. And that's why it's so important. If you, if you remember that Daniel, remember and his friends, they refused to eat the meat that was offered to them, but they requested the chief of the eunuchs that they might not defile themselves. They didn't demand, and they actually it had been brought into favor with him. So they offered an alternative. Okay, test us for 10 days. Give us something different to eat. And if you, if you test and see, then you'll see that we have come out better physically than the others. And God honored that. Uh, that's a, now, that isn't always possible. But we look for the creative way. We want to be a, a, in a way that uh, whenever any mandate or anything causes us to say, wow, I don't know if I can go along with this. And God wants us to do like Daniel did. Lord, is there a creative alternative? Is there a way we could obey without violating our conscience? Is there any way we could do it in a different way, a creative way that uh, is respectful to authority and also protects them? Because they're under authority as well. Now, here are some key biblical attitudes that I believe the church, and we're going to repeat these uh, in our studies, but that the church needs that Daniel had, that God is the one that sends his people into captivity when they do go, to humble them, to shine his lights in a dark culture. God had compassion on Nebuchadnezzar. This is a pagan ruler of a very dark culture, far worse than anything we face today. And yet, um, God had compassion and wanted to reach Nebuchadnezzar, and that could only happen in a positive way through his servants if they were respectful. And, and to birth the liberty model. We're going to talk about this, that the model that God birthed through Christ when he came, which we're celebrating this month in Christmas, came as a result of the legacy of Daniel and how he operated in this dark culture. And in Proverbs 29, 23, it says God... God resists the proud. The proud are the ones that are the trouble, and that God wants us to have a humble spirit. Humility is critical. But God has also said that his people are to be influential in their culture. We're not to isolate from the world. Neither are we to assimilate with it and just become like it. As John 17 says in Jesus' prayer, he said this, that um, I did not come to take you out of the world. I kept, I, I come to keep you from the evil while you are in the world. So we are not out of the world. We're in the world, but we're to be kept from the evil. So we're to be having internal separation from the things that we should not participate in. And this leads us to another value that uh, Daniel embraced that was also taught in the New Testament, that we have to dis discern the difference between associating with an evil government and participating in its evil actions. You see, Daniel worked for the government of Babylon. He worked under that system. He was assisting the king, but he was not, he would not participate in the king's evil deeds, but he was able to serve the king and be a light 
because God is the one who ordained civil government, even though it wasn't operating the way God designed it under someone like Nebuchadnezzar. I think sometimes these contrasts are so real in the Bible, so we can see the situation we're in is a bit better than those situations. And so we're not going to, so we can associate with individuals uh, in all kinds uh, that are not, are not godly, their intents might not be godly, we can be colleagues, but we can't, we have to say no, we have to know where that line is drawn and say no, we can't participate in the evil. A final thing that we did in Ephesians 5 articulates this very well, that love is the operated motive. Uh, motive. It should be in people of God. But another thing that uh, Daniel embraced was that believers don't have to have freedom to be faithful. I imagine these teenagers were very distraught being taken captive in Babylon. And yet they could still be faithful to God, even though they were not free. We're praying that freedom remain, obviously, in every case. But grace and truth has to be both kept together so that love and humility are the prevailing motive. As Colossians 4 says, to have salt in your speech. You're seasoned with love when you speak to people. Now, let's get into some illustrations. Um, I, I love this quote by Tim Keller uh, from Presbyterian Church there in New York and his um, concept on the exiles in a foreign land that Believers are more and more living in America in a foreign land, a pluralistic society. He wrote this in 2006, but listen to what he says. Christians should be humble before the new pagan pluralistic situation. Just as with the exiles, the situation is due in large part to our own failings. The church did not lose its position of privilege simply because of evil enemies of the faith. We lost our position as part of God's judgment on our pride our hypocrisy, our love of power, our prejudice, our bigotry, and failure to hold on to the truth. This is, why, this is the way in which God gets his people's attention. We must be far harder on ourselves in gracious, humble repentance than we are on the unbelieving culture around us. These are, these are very important words because it may be generational. Maybe this didn't happen to us directly, but then Keller continues. That was a major lesson for the exiles. That means the Babylonian exiles that we're talking about, and for us. Our first response should be repentance. We should be very understanding toward people who have failed to believe in Christ because of the weakness of the church's testimony. A lot of what is happening in our culture today may be more our fault than we are willing to admit. Our fault meaning generations of Christians. It is so easy to get angry at dictatorial practices of governors and others in our culture today. But when we do, we are acting in arrogance and pride. Anger is not the answer. The answer is, oh Lord, what are you teaching us in our hearts? What are you teaching us? How are you teaching us to be humble? Because we can stand for what is right and do it in a humble and a submissive attitude. Erwin Lutzer comments, comments in his book, uh, The Church in Babylon, he says this, is this, is this not God's agenda for the church today? Everything that has been nailed down is being torn up. Every day on the news, some new domino falls. The question is, what do we do? Perhaps God is saying, I am humbling you. I am letting you be defeated so that you might have the opportunity for ultimate triumph. So you and I need to recognize, God. I believe God's ultimate intent for the body of Christ, however long difficulties emerge or remain, his ultimate intent is that the church would walk in humility before God and humility before the world, rather than making it as if and blaming all the non-Christians for all of our problems. No, no. Remember, darkness cannot prevail where light truly shines. And therefore, and maybe we haven't done it directly, but the point is that has happened for generations. If you take a look at this timeline, and I know it's kind of small on your screen, you can look at the PowerPoints later on, but you'll notice that just prior to the captivity, Josiah had a revival under Josiah, and then he inspired Jeremiah. And if you remember, Jeremiah inspired Daniel. And you had these three individuals. They had very little effect in their ministries. 
And you think Daniel, he influenced three or maybe some more teenagers we don't know about in Daniel and the book of Daniel, but he influenced powerfully several empires in the Old Testament period. And the circle tells you what we're covering tonight, chapters two through four. We're going to highlight it. We can't read every verse, but we're going to highlight these visions and dreams. And what are the lessons we can learn today? And again, I urge you to take a look at these uh, more detailed when you have the PowerPoints in front of you. Um, but here's a question I've had for years. How could Daniel have so successfully interpreted the king's dreams? I mean, dreams and visions are not easy to interpret, especially when the king says in that first one in Daniel chapter 2, I don't, I'm not even going to tell you what the dream is. You're going to have to pray to God and find out what the dream is. I want you to understand that we um, dreams and visions combine hearing God through his word. Now, Daniel had parts of the Old Testament. He had the five books of the Pentateuch, Genesis through Deuteronomy. He had some of the prophets and the kings, and he had lots of scrolls at his disposal. And when he was a child, up to the age of 13 or 14, he studied these. He knew the word of God. It's obvious by the life that he led. So he knew the principles of God and how God works with bringing down pride and tyrants. And not only that, he um, walked with God in prayer and understood his word. And ancient history has a climax. And he saw this. He saw the promises in the Old Testament word uh, for the Messiah to be born. Keep in mind that during the time of Daniel's captivity is when Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel in the Old Testament, had all his visions and all his symbolic visions in the book of Ezekiel. He ministered right during the time Daniel was in Babylon. But Daniel understood the patterns of tyranny, and he also understood Babylon itself. Remember, he was trained for three years in Babylonian knowledge. So he did not, did not just come up with these ideas out of nowhere. Now, certainly, he had to hear from God about what the vision was. And you have to really hear from God. I imagine they prayed quite a bit to, to realizing their lives were at stake if they could not come up with that vision of the dream he had and then the interpretation. But the interpretation of dreams follows a biblical pattern. Um, we know that Daniel knew this, that God's liberty is decentralized because he always begins with the individual, what we call the bottom. Tyranny is centralized power. It's the state being God. Daniel understood this. Daniel, Daniel understood that centralized tyranny cannot maintain itself generation after generation. Every succeeding empire is going to get weaker and weaker. And ancient history has a climax. The Messiah is going to be born. So you see, you and I recognize that there's, he knows this. And that's why when we do our last study, we're going to look just briefly in the prophecy in Daniel chapter 9, which is fulfilled to the very week of Jesus coming and, uh, and of course, dying for our sins. And so we're going to focus on Christ here. But we recognize this, that Daniel understood these things. So it wasn't totally out of thin air that he would do this. And yet in Daniel chapter 2, and this is only a year after Daniel's taken captivity, he's only 15 years of age when he's brought before Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 2. Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar has this dream. Here's an image on the screen, a picture of the dream. And, and, and Daniel has this uh, is brought in because Nebuchadnezzar says, I'm going to bring all my astrologers and all my philosophers. Isn't it interesting that in the book of Daniel, the contrast is given. If Daniel had not been there, there would have been only one voice on one side and that was the astrologers and the philosophers that are coming from all different kinds of points of view. And that's all they would have heard. And yet when Daniel is there, he has a different point of view. And Daniel, of course, they were under a death sentence. You either give me the dream, never mind the interpretation. You tell me the dream or you're going to die. Daniel and his three friends spend all night in prayer. God, in your mercy, would you show us what this dream is? Otherwise, we die as martyrs at 14, 15, 16, 17 years of age. Teenagers in Babylon, having only been there about 12 months. But he was given this dream. And we know by hindsight, for Daniel, it was future 
centralized monarchies, each of which gets a bit weaker, which was the pattern shown in the word of God and the law of God, that the head of gold, which was Babylon, and I give you the dates of Babylon's reign, and then the Medo-Persian Empire, the chest of silver, and then the belly of brass, which we know historically was the Greek Empire with Alexander the Great, and then the legs of iron and clay, the Roman Empire, uh, which lasted the longest but was actually one of the weakest because it could never unify. And then, of course, the toes of iron and clay, they became divided. And that Roman Empire was taken down because of the toes of that clay. Imagine Daniel then saying, listen, you, this is what it means. It means that there are succeeding empires coming behind you, Nebuchadnezzar. But you are the most powerful. Now, let me tell you something just real quickly. If I'm serving God and I'm serving a dictator that can end my life at any moment, and I'm asking God to give me the most humble spirit of service I can possibly have, without arrogance and without anger. And I prayed and I found out this vision. I'd be so thankful to God that the first vision I get to interpret before the king tells him he's the head of gold. I would not want to say to him, you're the little toe down there and you're not worth a whole lot because that would end my life. But I, I would be glad to say, okay, Lord, in other words, God moves in such a way that when he sees this, it becomes clear. But that's not the end of the vision. The vision says, um, that he says to Daniel, says to Nebuchadnezzar, you watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Notice that the image is of a stone cut out without hands. That is a symbol in the Old Testament of the virgin birth of Christ. It is the stone that is the chief cornerstone of the kingdom of God, Christ himself. Here's a symbol of this. It's cut out without hands, meaning it's not of natural birth. It's, of, it's, it's a virgin birth. Here, so here's a, a, a uh, prophecy of the coming of Christ. He's not named as such, and it breaks the image at the feet because God's kingdom is from the bottom up. It doesn't hit him in the head. Because the kingdom of God is going to be birthed during the Roman Empire, the last one mentioned. Now, it's interesting because it said the stone that struck the image, you can see on the lower right, became a great mountain that filled the whole earth because the kingdom of God will fill the whole earth. It's not receding. It's going to win eventually in time over every kingdom. That's why Revelation eleven fifteen 15 says the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. The kingdom of God is built from the bottom up. This is amazing because it fits the principles of God's word, and he ministers this to Nebuchadnezzar. Now, the amazing thing about this is that uh, here Daniel interprets this clearly. Now, what you don't know is when you turn your Bible from chapter 2 of Daniel to chapter 3, it's 19 years later. Now, the Bible doesn't say that. But if you take any chronological Bible, you'll see the gap of at least 19, 20 years. Some have a little more. Uh, it's very difficult to be exact. But we know very closely that by the time Daniel 3.1 has come, he, Nebuchadnezzar has had 19 years to think about himself as the head of gold. So no wonder he gets caught up in pride. In fact, the entire Babylonian Empire is nicknamed the Empire of Pride in ancient history because they were so proud of how big they were. Listen, every tyrant is filled with pride. Every time. But if you call it today the deep state, if you call it whatever you want to call it, they're filled with pride. They think they have the last say. They think they're going to totally do whatever they want to do, but they're not counting on God. And here it goes to Nebuchadnezzar's head. Even though he extols God, the king made an image of gold. He made an image of himself, a big statue of himself. And then he's the state, the dictator is God. And then he calls by law everybody to worship the state. Now, Daniel is now 34. He's now a bit older. And uh, recognizing that, uh, actually older than that, actually, 
uh, with this. And uh, he's probably in his early 40s. And you have, uh, or a little less than that, and you have him, how you have Daniel, what is he going to do? 99.9%. Now listen, by the time this event happens, there are probably thousands and thousands of those from Judah already captive in Babylon. And the question is, where were they? If only three didn't bow, and you can see the picture of how unmistakably that would be, that they're just standing up there. Everyone else is bowing. Oh my gosh, this is totally amazing. You recognize this is made because they said, look, there are certain Jews who you said over the affairs. Remember, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, their, their Babylonian names, were over the governmental realms. They were political magistrates in Babylon. They were set over the administration. Daniel had been promoted after he interpreted the dream, and they were set over this. So here these are government officials refusing to bow to Nebuchadnezzar. Now, you know the rest of the story. Here's what happens. And of course, in Daniel 3, uh, Nebuchadnezzar says, Is it true that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I've set up? And who is the God that will deliver you from my hands? Now, of course, he knew their God was the Jewish God, Jehovah. Their answer is amazing. The three of them answer, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. In other words, we've already made up our minds. We did when we were teenagers. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. In other words, if, if you are true and we die, fine. But he's able to deliver us if he wants to. But even if we don't, we're being delivered out of your hand. This made Nebuchadnezzar furious. And what did he say? He said, uh, and he will deliver us from your hand, they said, O king. But if not, let it be known to you. We do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. And he commanded certain mighty men of valor to bind and cast them into the furnace and heat it up seven times hotter, which meant that the very soldiers that threw them into the fire died because the fire was so great, they had to be killed in order to put them in. So this is fury and anger. This is the way a dictator does. And yet they stood calmly, confidently. We can be fairly confident without sarcasm and said, no, we have to draw the line. But even when we draw the line, we are drawing the line in such a way that our heart is humble more before God than it is resisting even the dictator. This is the amazing thing. Here they are, late 30s, early 40s. And it's been years since that first vision. And of course, the miracle takes place in verse 24 and 25. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished. He rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, did we not cast three bound into the midst of the fire? Look, he answered, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Now, some Hebrew texts say an angel but he looks like it is a son of God was a phrase used for angels as well. And then, of course, when they came out of the furnace, the hair of their head was not singed, nor were their garments affected. The smell of fire was not even on them. Nebuchadnezzar spoke and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him, and they have frustrated the king's word. Now, wouldn't you and I desire to have a tyrant of a pagan nation who worships in complete evil, who has total power, who takes total power, who at the moment of his word or the motion of his hand can put anybody to death. No due process, no rights of any kind, no liberties. How do you reach such an empire? How do you reach such a dictator? Well, you do when all of a sudden believers are captive and they act like believers in humility. And it didn't take a majority because, listen, we Daniel must have been on another assignment or he would have been standing also because the scriptures are clear he did not compromise his faith. So he just happened not to be at that time period or not in that area. But here they have these individuals 
How do you do it? When he sees God intervene and doesn't always intervene the same way, but it is clear that this happens. In fact, if we look at this, there are several lessons we can, we can see. The only thing that burned was what bound them, all the ropes and cords that they were bound in, in the fiery furnace of affliction, in the fiery conflict of conscience, and the difficulty is when we're free. Faithfulness is going in the fire. It's not always coming out. They would have still been faithful had they died in the furnace. They would have been, because faithfulness is the primary thing. They had no guarantee of coming out. They were clear to Nebuchadnezzar. But God's presence is the reward for faithfulness. The presence of God is in the midst of the fire. Whatever fire God is going to allow believers to go through in the culture we're in, his presence will be the reward if our hearts are focused on him and we are humble before God and respectful toward people in every possible way. And don't react in anger as if it's somebody else's fault. But we clearly take it. And a lot of people would say, wait a minute, I'm not the one that compromised 50 years ago uh, in this nation. No, and that's why Daniel comes in as well. Because Daniel identified with the sins of Israel and Judah even though he didn't commit the sins himself. And that's what we're going to see in Daniel 9 and 10. But you see, they were ended up being promoted with greater responsibility to serve, not just exercise power. Tyrants always move in power. You know, it's interesting when Nebuchadnezzar says, okay, the God of Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, that's the true God. And if anyone says anything against that God, I'll cut you in pieces, tear down your property. In other words, He's not giving any liberty to anyone. He goes from one extreme to the other because that's what dictators do. And yet he's being impacted in his heart. But it takes a lot of time. Now, 10 to 15 years later, and again, Daniel's in his 50s now. That's actually 54 to 59 years uh, later. There's, uh, In other words, Daniel now is in his 50s when Nebuchadnezzar still has another dream. And this is interesting because in chapter 4 of Daniel, another lesson comes, and this is the lesson that culminates in God ministering. Now, think about it. Uh, most of us would say, look, if I'm in an evil empire, if I'm under evil dictators, if I'm under rulers that are very evil, I might pray for them and for my humility before God for a week, maybe a year, uh, but decades? Up from the time I'm 16 till the time I'm 56? Are you kidding me? Because you see, Daniel is ministering to Nebuchadnezzar throughout his almost his entire reign. And he reigned 44 years in uh, Babylon. And um, probably 41 of those, he has Daniel ministering right with him. And of course, this time he shared his dream. And he said, I saw a dream which made me afraid. The thoughts on my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. But at last, Daniel came before me. Of course, he called in the worldly philosophers first and tried their method. They couldn't understand it. His name is Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God. Remember, Belteshazzar actually means Marduk, which is the highest god in Babylon. So he's named Daniel his God. According to the name of my God, in him is the spirit of the holy God. The tree that you saw is you, O king, he says. Now, see, the, the vision was simple. He saw this massive tree, which was uh, very great. And then he heard an angel come and said, chop down the tree, as you see in verse 23. But leave its stump and its roots in the earth till seven times pass over him. So he's saying, well, this made me afraid. This is a great, beautiful tree. And he was afraid. Daniel might tell him, you are the tree, because that tree gets cut down. Now, the interesting thing is, that um, after 12 months, that, that vision does not come true right away. Nebuchadnezzar is so lifted up in pride in spite of that vision. He says, look, isn't this the palace I've built? Isn't this the wonderful place I've done? This is all for my glory. And he said, this is the interpretation, Daniel said, and this is the decree. They shall drive you from men. That's his own cabinet, his own individuals there, because he's going to go mad. Your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen. They shall wet you with the dew of heaven, and seven times will pass over you, till you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, 
and gives it to whom, to whom so ever he chooses. So Nebuchadnezzar, you're now going to get the ultimate lesson in humility. Now, by the way, I was reading in a, um, a, an encyclopedia on Babylon years ago, written in the 1800s and, uh, and some earlier. And it talked about the fact that lycanthropy was an actual disease that people did liken to someone becoming like an animal. Now, it used to have a simple definition, but I looked it up today and, the, and on the internet it says, it's a very rare condition and is largely considered to be an idiosyncratic expression of a psychotic episode caused by another condition such as schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, or clinical depression. Now look, most people had said this is where an individual goes mad with mental illness and actually thinks they're an animal. Now, we know that God is the one that brought this and allowed this to come on Nebuchadnezzar. Now, we know from secular studies that it's Nebuchadnezzar's wife that ruled the empire for seven years while Nebuchadnezzar was out in the fields. And uh, just before this was fulfilled, Daniel said the following. This is a principle God has. He said in verse 27, let my advice be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by being righteous, your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Perhaps there may be a lengthening of your prosperity. He said, listen, Nebuchadnezzar, this is a warning from God. Repent. But Nebuchadnezzar didn't. And in 12 months, he was intoxicated again with his own power. And he actually did grow fingernails like eagle's claws, hair. He had to live in the wilderness for seven years. And during those seven years, as becomes very significant in the next lesson next week, that Nebuchadnezzar's wife ruled Babylon. And guess who was the first vice president, so to speak, of Babylon? They didn't have presidencies. It was Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. So therefore, his wife ruled while Daniel was her advisor when Nebuchadnezzar was being judged by God. And at the end of the 12 months, of course, Nebuchadnezzar says, this is my Babylon that I have built, and the very hour the word is fulfilled. But at the end of those seven years, he comes back, just like the stump was in the ground. He has the kingdom restored to him, and he says, at the time of the end, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven. All of, his, all of whose works are truth and his ways justice. And those who walk in pride, he is able to put down. I submit to you that the overarching lesson for Daniel here, we've seen it, his lesson is to serve with a great attitude, to pray for those who might even want us harmed, who want liberty removed. May pray for the ones who even have Christianity as, a, as their enemy, and say, God, I pray, Lord, that you'd give me a humble attitude toward you first. I cannot draw a line in the sand and resist properly without being humbled before you. But God, help me to do that, and not do it in arrogance, in pride, or in anger. And wouldn't it be amazing, because God can intervene at any time. I, I love to think that God could bring a humility upon the worst dictators or financing the worst evil in the world by having them humbled and make the same confession Nebuchadnezzar made. That's why I put it as my backdrop, because God humbled a dictator that was one of the most ruthless dictators in all of ancient history. And he did so because there were a remnant of people with him, Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, who during these decades, from the ages of 14 to in the 50s, probably 55, served Nebuchadnezzar. He was first a co-ruler with his father, Nabopolassar. And then when his father died, he continued reigning for up to 44 years. So after this vision, when he was humbled for seven years, and when his wife reigned, and then he came back to the throne, he probably only ruled a few years at most before he passed away. But Daniel is still living. He's in his 50s, but he successfully served this monarch. And keep in mind, there are not visions and dreams every week, at least that we know of, that were recorded. 
Most weeks and months, he just simply did his duties as a servant, administering the affairs of Babylon without contaminating himself in the deeds of Babylon that were evil. And so did Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. And here we have these individuals serving year after year, decades after decades, and doing it clearly out of God. He understood spirit and truth. He understood God's word and a knowledge of tyrannical rule. And he was able, through his own sincerity, to prepare a monarch to help advance God's kingdom, meaning that this was a key point to prepare for the release of the Jews to return to Jer Jerusalem. God would work through Daniel, one person. He had, of course, the other three with him, but he was a great minority. And he would be instrumental, as we will see, in how this works. His, they served humbly for decades without any demonstration of God's power, quietly serving. Always keep in mind, this, this is the danger we have in reading the book of Acts. We think there's a miracle every day or every week. It's not true. Sometimes months and years go by. There's nothing actually recorded except humbly serving. Don't get um, upset when you don't see any massive thing happening every day. Daniel's influence impacted a pagan ruler, and that's huge. And I would suggest that here you read Daniel chapters 2 through 4. A lot of it, of course, is the dream and vision of Nebuchadnezzar and um, Daniel and Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, their, their prayers and uh, their interpretation. But we can ask God to give us a focus of being faithful in the little things. Devotion to God, our families, our spheres of influence. Uh, serve right where your garden is. Don't get discouraged with that. You probably are making more of an impact than you know. But ask God for that humble spirit and our respectful attitude. And the way we treat people is huge. It's massive. It's actually preparing for God to do a massive thing. And that can happen uh, in, in the way that we are, are doing things today. And it can happen in the midst of tyranny. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close this part and uh, unmute you.